Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Hey, this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. I think this is podcast number 12. It is now January of 2017, and I wanted to talk today about nutrition. I think my hobby, even though I'm mostly into art and music and I love to travel, I think that my hobby is uh, nutrition. Like, I, I don't think I could ever, like, go to school and get a degree in nutrition because I'm not scientific enough to fully want to do that. But it seems like in my spare time, I do a lot of research on nutrition. And recently, well, three years ago, my own health and nutrition has been greatly impacted by stopping eating all wheat and all gluten and most grains. And I did that three years ago because I was told I wasn't feeling very well. I was feeling tired and just not just like I knew something was wrong and more than just depressed. I was just kind of my body felt kind of tired in a certain way, even though I exercise and I ate fairly healthy, I thought anyway. Uh, they told me that my thyroid was underactive and I'm somebody that's mostly eaten like fruits and vegetables and meat, and, but I definitely loved bread. And I used to get like organic bread you know, like whole grain, organic, not a lot of fake preservatives. Um, But I love the rosemary bread and olive bread that they have at Trader Joe's and I love to toast it. But I was noticing that I pretty much was eating bread every single day. So to make a long story short, they put me on medication for my underactive thyroid. I think it's hypothyroidism that's underactive and then hyperthyroidism is overactive thyroid. So I had underactive thyroid. So they put me on this certain medication for it. And at the same time, I decided to stop eating all grain and all wheat because a naturopath told me that that might help my immune system, which is the key to health. And so if you eat a diet that helps your immune system, then whatever other issues you have might get better or totally reverse. Like some people that are diabetic that have type 2 diabetes, like later in life as an adult, they become diabetic. They've been able to reverse it just through changing their diet. I know people that used to be on insulin and they radically changed their diet and started exercising more and drinking more water and getting enough sleep and they were able to go off insulin and not need to inject themselves with insulin to keep their blood sugar at a healthy level. So basically, I did the same thing with my thyroid. I, I'm not diabetic at all, but I, I'm, I've always had a fear of, doing, of becoming diabetic because I feel like if you eat a lot of sugar and carbs and a lot of junk food all day, the fact that that, you know, I'm surprised not everybody is diabetic that eats complete junk food. If you eat lots of sugar and carbs, I think it's a normal response for your body to become diabetic. So the same thing with cats and dogs. And so the point of this monologue is to share my own story that I stopped eating wheat and grain and I occasionally eat rice and oats now, but I don't really eat any wheat or bread at all, zero. I went cold turkey. And I ended up being told by my doctor that I should go off the medication because that they were over treating me at that point. So that meant that my my own natural body was, uh, for my immune system, I guess, was making my thyroid was working properly. So my only explanation for that is going off wheat and also being really mindful and careful about eating too much sugar. You know, I love chocolate. I love sugar. I love fruit and I love chocolate. So, and I love ice cream. I also don't eat much dairy. I don't I don't drink milk. Haven't drank uh, dairy, cow milk in years. And I used to get like almond milk, soy milk, coconut milk, you know, all the different kinds of of non-dairy milk. But then I was reading the ingredients and they put a lot of guar gum, carrageenan, safflower oil, various fillers in these kinds of fake milk. And so I don't consume that either. I I drink my coffee black with a little bit of honey in it, raw honey. But I do not consume um, cow milk or, or vegan milk made from rice, soy, hemp, 
almond, coconut, all the different kinds of milks. And if I do get a milk every once in a while, I usually get the non-dairy kind. But again, those are full of fillers. So basically my thyroid got better because I think because I stopped eating wheat and that was three years ago and I'm continuing. I also lost about 40 pounds. I definitely was trying to lose weight. I exercise quite a bit. I've been slacking off on that lately, but I generally have always, ever since I was about 13 years old, I was raised by parents. They divorced when I was four, but my mom and dad both are into eating pretty healthy, nutritious food. And as a kid, of course, I wanted them to give me more junk food, but um, now I'm glad that they mostly made me eat pretty healthy, like real food, like fruits and vegetables and meat and beans and, you know, like real food as opposed to TV dinners or like fake frozen microwave type foods. So I am very, very grateful that my parents fed me pretty healthy and um, definitely nutrition has always been something that I care about and that I'm interested in. And so I have expanded that to include my cat. Recently, my cat, uh, I thought there was something wrong with him. So I took him to the vet. I thought he had a kidney issue because I've had many cats in my life. And usually when they get older, they start drinking a lot of water and peeing a lot. And so I was afraid that my cat had a kidney issue. And my previous cat actually had kidney and liver failure and Stella and she passed away and I tried really hard to help her and she just passed away anyway, long story, but that was really sad. And my new cat, Kisun, that I've had over a year, he was starting to drink a lot of water and pee a lot and his poop was kind of runny and stinky and like diarrhea and I knew something was wrong. So I took him to the vet and he's kind of slim. He's not overweight. If anything, he's too thin. I don't actually think he's too thin, but he kind of is on the thin side. I wonder sometimes if he gained weight, it'd probably be good for him. Uh, so he's definitely not overweight. He's like underweight. So I took him to the vet. They did a blood test and he was very stressed out at the vet. To make a long story short, she said he seemed fine, except his blood sugar was really high. And so she thought, well, he might be diabetic, which is a surprise because she said he seemed like not a diabetic cat in terms of uh, palpating him and looking at him, he seemed pretty healthy to her, maybe a little bit dehydrated. So basically she told me that he might be diabetic and I got really scared and thought, oh no, I might have to inject him with insulin every day. It's very complicated and a little bit expensive and a little bit dangerous because you need to get the levels right or you could, you could kill the cat accidentally if you give him too much or too little insulin. So to make a long story short, that was a couple weeks ago, I think, I got uh, urine strips. The vet said if I got the urine strips made for humans, you can test the glucose and ketone level in their urine. And so I've been testing him almost every day and it's become, it's it's turned out normal. The level in his, in his urine, his sugar is normal and not elevated. And I asked my vet how, how, um, uh, how accurate are those? She says, those are pretty accurate. So if you're testing him every day and it's showing up not, high in sugar, that he's probably not diabetic. So now we think he's probably not diabetic. And to make a long story short, I also switched his food to raw meat diet. And I don't just mean like, I don't just feed him scraps of meat that I eat. I don't eat a lot of meat, but I do eat meat. But I get, I went to the health food pet store. I was feeding my cat uh, grain-free, organic, natural pet food that had meat in it but it was canned food and dry food that was grain free. But then I found out that it's actually high in starch and carbs because it has guar gum and carrageenan and vegetable oil and potato starch and rice starch. You know, they, so instead of putting wheat in these foods and you know, there's actually sugar and corn syrup in the cheapest cat food you can find. There's wheat gluten and corn syrup, which is the worst thing you could feed your cat or dog. So if your cat or dog has diabetes, read the label on the food that you're feeding them because it might be too high in carbs and starch. Cats and dogs are just like humans in terms of if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, it's really hard on your pancreas. And especially cats and dogs. I, I've heard that dogs need more carbs than cats, but the cats actually are true carnivores and they need hardly any carbs at all. And they're a lot healthier if they mostly eat uh, protein and fat and not carbs. 
So dogs are a little different apparently uh, than cats in terms of that, in terms of the balance of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. But what I do is I go to the health, uh, pet food health store, basically, natural food for pets, and I get uh, freeze-dried raw meat food that has taurine and facillin husks and flaxseed and different vitamin mineral blends, along with mostly just raw meat like turkey, chicken, uh, they have lamb, rabbit, venison, beef, all those different kinds of meats. Maybe they have buffalo, I'm not sure. But I feed him that and then I crush it up with some water and a f fork and what else? And then I get him frozen raw meat, which is mostly just meat. I think there's egg, crushed eggshells in it and maybe egg yolks. And there's like raw, organic, usually free range meat, you know, chicken, turkey, bison, venison, lamb, rabbit. I haven't tried the rabbit yet, but I think he'll probably like it. So basically I'm rotating him through. Basically I'm lucky because there's a, a vet online. Um, what is her name? I need to look her name up. There's a naturopathic vet online and I've been watching videos that she's made and she seems to really know what she's talking about. I think it's Dr. Karen Becker. I'm pretty sure it's Dr. Karen Becker, B-E-C-K-E-R, Dr. Karen Becker. She's a real vet, you know, she has a real degree in veterinary medicine, and she also is a kind of a specialist in naturopathic medicine for cats and dogs. She knows a lot about nutrition and how to make bone broth soup for cats and dogs if they're feeling ill and to help supplement their their um, their diet. So basically my cat and I are both on a pretty healthy diet right now and I feed my cat this raw frozen meat and also for people who are worried about the bacteria that's in meat, if, if raw frozen meat has been, sorry, if meat has been frozen for at least three days, it tends to kill, it actually does kill all the dangerous bacteria. But also cats and dogs have bacteria in their intestinal tract more so, even salmonella sometimes naturally, more so than we do as humans. So a lot of people are afraid of raw food diets for two reasons. One, because they're afraid of the bacteria that could harm the pet or harm the human feeding the pet. And they're also afraid that, that the, the cat or dog is not getting enough nutritional balance because if you just feed your cat or dog, you know, table scraps from your own food, they're not going to get the right vitamin and mineral balance and fat and protein and all that. So that's why I don't make my own raw pet food. That's a little more complicated. I might look up uh, recipes for that, but I would probably have to buy not just chicken or beef. I would have to get like liver and organ meats. And I, I don't really want to go to the store and buy organ meats. And I don't really have a food processor, but I guess the healthiest way to make your own pet food for dogs or cats is to get uh, raw chicken or beef or turkey and also get gizzards and hearts and livers of these different animals and necks and grind them up in a blender or a food processor. Grind all that stuff up and then put it in your freezer for three days and then you mix it with vitamin and mineral like you you I don't know what the seasoning is but there's some kind of like vitamin and mineral supplements that you can mix in with the meat to make it more balanced and facillin husks and flax seeds to give them more fiber. And I've heard that uh, dogs can thrive on certain fruits and vegetables mixed in with the raw meat, whereas cats, I think cats can eat some vegetables for the fiber, but I don't think fruit is very good for cats. They don't really do well on very many carbs or sugar. So that's why I just get, so far, I'm just getting food that's from the healthy pet food store that says it's certified as balanced and nutritionally complete for cats. And so it has the right amount of taurine, which I think is a mineral that cats need. I'm not sure if dogs need taurine or not, but I know dogs and cats need slightly different mineral balance of vitamins and minerals and fat, carbs, and protein. So I just know more about cat food. So I'm getting him, I, every day I feed him freeze-dried and frozen raw meat that I mix together in a little bowl 
and I, I give him small portions. I took away all of his dry food. He absolutely was starting to hate the food I was giving him. And so I was really worried because his appetite, he seemed like he was really hungry and wanted food. But then when I would try to feed him, he didn't, he was like, yeah, I'm hungry, but I don't want that. So I was scared. I was like, well, what's wrong with him? Because he's hungry and yet he won't eat. And his poo was all like gross and putrid and, and diarrhea a lot of the time. And he was drinking constantly and peeing constantly. And so I was worried. And so I switched him. And apparently some cats don't thrive. If you try to switch them overnight, they have a reaction to it. But he didn't. He immediately loved the food I was giving him. I started him freeze-dried and raw meat and I mushed it up in a bowl with some water and he drank it he just licked it all and I've noticed to make a long story short I've been feeding him this way for I think two weeks now and he tends to eat every single bit that's in his bowl he licks his bowl clean most of the time and his poop he poops less at first I was afraid he was constipated because he suddenly kind of stopped pooping for a couple days and then he pooped and it was so different and he he basically drinks a lot less water and he pees every day but he only pees like a little bit here a little bit there previously he was peeing constantly to the point where I was thinking he was dehydrated because he was constantly drinking and constantly peeing and on a raw meat diet he his pee and poop has totally changed he doesn't seem to want I give him fresh water in a bowl every day but he doesn't seem to care about that. And he used to get up on the sink in the bathroom and drink tons of water that I had in a, in a cup up by the sink. He doesn't do that anymore. He totally radically overnight changed. And he also started running up and down and playing and jumping and acting like a younger kitten. He's about nine years old, my cat. His name is Kisun, which is Russian for kitty. Kitty, kitty, Kisun. And he... <clears throat> Basically, his digestion changed overnight. I've heard online, uh, Dr. Karen Becker, the vet that I was telling you about, she has YouTube uh, videos, and she said that usually you have to transition a cat or dog very slowly and gradually to raw food diet, to raw meat food diet. Because I'm afraid if I just say raw food for cats or dogs, people will think I mean vegan, but I don't mean like a vegetarian vegan diet. I mean raw meat because cats and dogs need meat. Um, so go with nature there. Is, is I, I agree with people who say go with na what nature intended. So basically feeding your cat and dog dry food in a box and processed canned food is kind of the equivalent to me eating TV dinners and canned food all the time. Like if I never had fresh meat or or um, fruit or vegetables or you know raw dairy products if I never I don't really eat a lot of dairy but if I only ate frozen processed food uh, nutrition bars and candy bars and power bars and granola bars and if I just ate like a whole bunch of like canned like if I if I just ate canned meat and I mean, imagine, imagine what it would be like to just live on canned food. And I don't mean like homemade organic canned food that you do at home and you can organic foods and keep them really fresh and don't do weird preservative things to them. That seems okay. But if you, if, if I just went to the store and bought canned meat, canned fruit, canned vegetables, uh, frozen TV dinners, even if they're organic, you know, like frozen dinners that are organic, they still have weird like processed preservatives in them and just strange like, you know, they have to heat stuff up, especially when they can things. They do weird heating processes to keep them from spoiling and they add strange fillers. And so basically feeding your dog or cat canned food all the time is similar to, you know, a human is not going to thrive on canned and frozen food all the time. So basically that's why I switched my cat to a raw meat diet that's both frozen and freeze dried. I mean, I guess optimally it would be even healthier if I got fresh raw meat from the butcher and then I got a food processor and I ground up liver and heart 
and raw chicken or beef and I grind it up and then I added the proper, you know, taurine and, and minerals and vegetables and vitamins and minerals, etc. Not vegetables, but vitamins and minerals and facillin husk and flaxseed for fiber. I think you can also grind up small bones in a food processor and you can feed that to your pets. But what I do is I go to the pet food store and I make sure to get the made from whole natural foods, raw, freeze dried and frozen cat food is what I get for my cat. I also have started um, eating what's called diatomaceous earth. And diatomaceous earth, some people are very afraid of it. You get food grade diatomaceous earth. That's the only safe kind to consume. There's another kind they sell at like hardware stores that you can use in your garden to kill bugs and people use it for filtering pools, I guess. So it's it's used for more industrial type purposes and it has other chemicals in it aside from diatomaceous earth and I guess the compound itself is processed in a different way. So diatomaceous earth made for your garden is not safe to eat. It has to be food grade diatomaceous earth which you can get at a pet store, a health food pet store, you can also get it at organic health food stores. I got it in the supplement section of a health food store here in Seattle, which I like to go to. And you can also order it online. It's it's less expensive, actually, if you get it online. The next batch I get will be online. I think they sell it by the pound. And I think, yeah, it's it's. I basically take a teaspoon a day so far and I dissolve it in water, I mix it in water, it doesn't fully dissolve, so you just stir it up and I drink it and it tastes kind of like clay. Um, I grew up with a mom, art, an artist mom who works in clay and so it reminds me of clay, the texture and the flavor of diatomaceous earth. It's kind of like, it's really smooth, powdery, um, it's ground up powder and it's basically fossilized algae. So just look up diatomaceous earth. I'm not sure how to spell that off the top of my head, but diatomaceous earth. And it's got a lot of minerals. It has silica and it has minerals in it. And it can, they, some people say it can kill parasites and worms in your body as well as your pet's body. So I'm basically very gently adding it to my diet and I fed a little bit to my cat. I put like about an eighth of a teaspoon in some of his food and mixed it up with water and he didn't seem to notice and he ate it and he's, he's acting totally fine. He doesn't seem to feel bad at all. I'm just very cautiously doing that to make sure it's safe for him. Everything I've read says it's safe. The worst thing I've heard about it is that it sometimes just does nothing. It can constipate some people or it can just do nothing for some people. But so far for me, it actually feels like it's having a calming effect on me. I put about a teaspoon in some water in the morning before I eat anything and I drink it and it tastes kind of not like spectacular. It tastes kind of like uh, clay water. You could say it tastes kind of like dirt, but it, it tastes to me more like clay than dirt. It's kind of got a, uh, a grainy, consistency a little bit slimy like slip you know when you add water to clay and it's called slip well it's kind of like that but thinner because it's mostly just water and a, a small teaspoon of diatomaceous earth and you mix it up and you drink it and it really reminds me of clay so it's like drinking clay water and apparently it has silica and calcium and iron and mag mag manganese or how do you say maybe magnesium, but I think mag manganese, but different minerals. And it supposedly can dry out and kill parasites and worms that are in your body as well as your cat or dog's body. And you, um, it, it also supposedly can help your skin and hair and fingernails and toenails. And they say it's good for many different things. So I don't even want to list all the things they say it's good for, but it has a negative ionic charge, kind of like the ocean. It actually comes from the ocean. And apparently things with a negative ion charge attract things with a positive ion charge. And so the theory is, is that if you eat diatomaceous earth, you know, drink it in water, 
it can um, take toxins and suck them right out of your body because it, it the toxins in your body, I think mushrooms do a similar thing. If you eat mushrooms in your diet, I don't mean the kind that make you high, but I mean just uh, nutritional mushrooms that you eat for, you know, nutritional value. Um, it, it acts as a filter and it things, toxins can stick. I don't really understand how it works, but toxins will stick to the diatomaceous earth. And so then when you go to the bathroom, it, the, the toxic things come out of your body and you just flush them down the toilet. So, so far I'm hoping that that's going to help me. I, as far as I know, I don't know that if I have parasites or worms, they say most people do have some kind of parasites in their bodies and don't even know it. I don't know. I also take uh, probiotic, prebiotic and probiotics, and I take uh, spirulina, and I take a little ashwagandha, which is an, an Ayurvedic herb. So far, diatomaceous earth, I've, I've taken it, I think, about four days in a row in the morning so far. I think it has a calming effect on me. Maybe it's the negative ions. It's kind of like when you go to the ocean. Recently, I was in Santa Barbara at the ocean, and I really enjoyed that. I love the smell of the ocean and the wind and the breeze. Well, I feel like diatomaceous earth has a calming effect on me. So I don't know. It's kind of subtle and hard to explain, but I feel like it's soothing, maybe because it's alkaline and it's not acidic. Or maybe it's the negative ion ion charge, the charge of ions. I don't know how you actually say that scientifically. I'm not really, I'm not a scientist, but I love nutrition. And I love hearing about biochemistry in the body and the metabolism and vitamins and minerals and all the different aspects of that. I absolutely love hearing that. So I am going to continue talking. I just got an email. Did you hear that sound? I got an email. Oh my gosh. So this is Shannon Kringen. You're listening to Goddess Kring podcast number 12. What is it like January 5th of 2017? So I'm talking about nutrition. I'm taking diatomaceous earth. I'm feeding my cat diatomaceous earth. I know some people cautioned me and said, don't do that. Take your cat to the vet, get him dewormed. I'm not even sure if he has worms or parasites. I've been looking at his poop and I'm not seeing anything, although they could be microscopic. I realize that, but I'm basically waiting. I'm continuing to feed him his raw, frozen and freeze dried meat diet, balanced from the health food pet store with taurine and vitamins and minerals and facillin husks and, you know, the, the fiber that he needs. And he's got a lot of enthusiasm. He's playing a lot. He seems really happy and healthy. And I'm checking his blood sugar or his urine sugar level. And he seems to be feeling well. He seems to be peeing and pooping in a healthy way. When you feed your cat or dog raw for, uh, meat diet, their digestive system changes and they drink less water because they get most of their water from their food. So I took him off the dry food and luckily overnight he was totally into it because some cats and dogs are um, freaked out when you switch their diet. So you have to gradually do it. He took to it right away. He acted as if, yes, this is exactly what I want. And so he's been eating his food and peeing and pooping really, really well. Um, although I did notice he poops less now and I was scared at first that he was constipated, but now he's, he's, um, he just pooped again recently. So he only poops like maybe every other day or every two days or something, every two or three days or something like that so far. And his poop is very firm and kind of small and firm and it, it hardly has a smell to it. It's not very smelly. So uh, once it dries, the smell goes away completely, but it, it really is very different. And his pee is a lot uh, smaller amount of pee, but he definitely pees every single day. So I'm glad his body is flowing in that way. His digestive system seems to be flowing well. I've even felt his, his uh, torso to make sure that he doesn't seem like he's bloated or blocked up in any way. I've been feeling his body his fur seems extra, a little bit extra smooth and shiny. And maybe it's too soon for that change to occur. But they do say when you feed your cat a raw meat diet, the fur can, can become healthier and shinier and softer and, and less dry, less dandruff on their fur, on their skin. 
and he definitely seems like the look in his eye he looks more like he has more energy he looks somehow younger he looks more um happy and excited to be alive he just i just think that he's doing better but i'm going to keep checking his his urine sugar level and eventually going to get his stool tested if he seems like he's not improving i just want to make sure but he seems like he's doing very well but i want to make sure he doesn't have any parasites or worms and some people say uh, that diatomaceous earth can help kill parasites and worms in both humans and cats and dogs so i am very cautiously feeding him a little bit of that in his food and seeing how that goes and i'm eating a table a teaspoon not a tablespoon but a teaspoon every day of diatomaceous earth dissolved in you know mixed in with water it doesn't really dissolve in the water it stays kind of like a cloudy gray color looks just like clay water basically and tastes kind of like clay water would taste so basically I keep stirring it and then you swallow it because it'll keep sinking down to the bottom of the glass and so you have to keep stirring it and then drink it up so I do that every day and it feels pretty good so maybe now I'll share what happened on uh, New Year's Eve. My boyfriend, again, this is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring podcast number 12, broadcasting from Seattle where I live. And on New Year's Eve, my boyfriend is in a rock and roll cover band called uh, Mod Men Band. And they played on New Year's Eve at a certain place in Burien near Seattle. And it basically snowed it started snowing one sad thing is that my boyfriend's window got smashed out the band played from 8 p.m to 1 a.m so it was a long show i did my job delivering groceries earlier in the day so i made some money doing that uh, for a living what i do is i full-time mostly full-time for the last um since 1992 24 Five, oh my god that's 25 years for the last 25 years I've been modeling for art classes drawing painting sculpture photography I'm the nude model sometimes clothed sometimes for portraits sometimes in a bodysuit sometimes in a costume I mostly model for art classes well recently I felt a little bit burned out because I have to constantly be seeking work and chasing after modeling jobs so I recently started experimenting and doing store audits and grocery shopping for other people and delivering groceries because I have really good gas mileage in my car and I kind of like to drive and use Google Maps and I'm practicing and learning all kinds of neighborhoods so basically I've been filling in the gaps when I don't have a modeling job I'm on call to be a grocery delivery person so I've been doing that it's kind of stressful it's kind of hard I kind of like it I kind of am stressed out by it because you're on a time deadline and you're trying to like hurry up and do it and yet do a good job and not make mistakes but you're trying to do it as fast as you can uh, I tend to be a little slower than what they want me to be but I just the only way I can do it is to do it that way so I'm doing my best well I did that and then I went to my boyfriend's show on New Year's Eve at this bar I'm not really a bar person but I love music so they play you know the Doors the Rolling Stones the Beatles the Who, um, um, David Bowie, Prince, you know, they play lots of different artists and um, they're a pretty good band. I'm pretty picky about music. They're pretty good. And I listened to them play and little did we know it started snowing outside maybe about 10 p.m. and this was in Burien. Apparently in Seattle, some neighborhoods hardly got any snow at all or a light dusting. Well, Burien and where my boyfriend lives is in Rainier Beach got like four or five inches of snow so to make a long story short at the end of the show we discovered that my boyfriend's window was smashed in and this was a horrible way to start the new year let me tell you it was very stressful his window was smashed and he had to load up all of his musical equipment into his car so we did that we called the police, but they didn't come until, you know, they didn't come and it was really getting late. It was like, you know, 2.30 in the morning. So we decided we had to leave and we drove and it was the scariest. I mean, I did a really good job. I have a little tiny smart car. My boyfriend has like a, like a, I don't know what kind of car he has, but it's like a four door, you know, 
bigger type of a car, a four-door kind of car, and like a sedan, I guess. And basically, he f- I followed him home, and we had to drive on the freeway from Burien to I-5, which is the 518 or something, and the snow was sticking. I have never seen snow stick to the freeway before. It was frightening. I've only driven in the snow a few times. I don't have snow tires or change or anything like that. I have my little tiny smart car, which actually does pretty well in the snow, apparently, uh, for a tiny car especially. But <laughs> it was scary. It was the scariest drive of my life. I was I was nauseous. My arms and legs were shaking. I was so scared because I followed him, and he's driven in the snow. He's lived in all kinds of different places where there was a lot more snow than what we have here because Seattle rarely gets snow, and when it does, everybody's like, oh, my God, you know, how do you drive in the snow? Well, basically, I followed him on the freeway, and it was really, really scary. It was like I was sliding a little bit on the freeway, like not back and forth, but like I was on the lane, and you couldn't really see the lanes because the snow was coming down so hard that it was sticking. There was probably like two inches on the freeway already, and it was like sticking to the freeway, and you couldn't see... I just had to follow him in front of me and I was just worried about other cars sliding into me. I was worried about me sliding into another car. So basically most people were giving each other lots and lots of space. And this again was about probably 2.30 or 3 in the morning by this time. And we drove I think about 40 miles an hour on the freeway. You know, we're supposed to go 60 or 65. We were going about 40, which seemed fast enough to me because it was snowing. And there was a car on the other side of the freeway that had spun out into a ditch. And it was like really frightening for me to see that. I've just never seen snow. You know, I thought, oh, as soon as we get onto the freeway, it'll be fine. But no, it was really, really dense, thick snow that was sticking like crazy to the freeway. So basically, to make a long story short, we made it from Burien to his house in Rainier Beach. But he lives on the top of kind of a steep hill. So basically, we were on the freeway. And I, I slid a little bit, like, again, I, I knew, I knew not to put on the brakes because apparently people who usually spin out in the snow and slide into ditches, either they're going too fast or too slow, and then they slam on the brakes. If you start sliding in the snow and you put your brakes on, it makes it worse. So basically I knew don't put your brakes on. If you start sliding, just take your, your foot off the acceleration pedal and try to slow down by taking your foot off the the accelerator not putting your foot on the brake so I basically didn't panic and I was like okay I'm sliding a little bit but I was basically staying in the lane I wasn't sliding out of control I was just kind of not you know driving perfectly in the lane the way I wanted to so I was kind of going a little bit to the side you know kind of going a little crooked there and I didn't like that and it sounded weird on my tires too the snow sounded really weird and I felt kind of nauseous and a little dizzy and I didn't want to faint because I faint sometimes when they take blood samples and when I go to the dentist and they inject me with Novocaine I just have this fear of needles and so on the on the freeway driving in the snowstorm I had a feeling of fear And so I felt a little nauseous and my arms and legs felt kind of weak and shaky. And I was like, God, I hope I don't faint because you don't want to faint when you're driving a car. That's pretty scary. But I didn't faint. I just, I was, I just had to tell myself, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm a smart, good driver in the snow. Everything's fine. I had to keep telling myself that mantra. I was following my boyfriend and the snow looked so weird. It was actually kind of bothering my eyes because it was, there was like, I wish I could have show you a video. It was like, it was like, you know, big white dots, you know, going towards me. So it's kind of like hypnotizing me and I didn't light in a bad way. It was kind of making me feel, I have astigmatism in my eyesight. So it was making my eyes feel kind of nauseous. It was just, I can't even explain it, but it, it just felt kind of nauseous watching the snow like that and trying to concentrate. I also felt like I couldn't tell how fast I was going because you, the snow makes everything look so different that you can't tell. It was just like being on another planet and it was kind of scary. And so basically we we got off on the exit and then we realized that the hill was too steep. And then we went as far as we could go towards his house and then we saw there was a snow plow or a sander or something. And then there was all these people like stuck or waiting. 
So basically he said, okay, plan B, we're going to go a different route. And so I, I followed him very cautiously on this other route. We had to do like a big loop around his neighborhood and go up this hill that was less steep. But when we got to the other hill that was less steep, there was people getting stuck. And, and he said it's because I was thinking, okay, maybe the hill's just too steep. My boyfriend said, no, it's because people that aren't used to driving in the snow, they're afraid to go fast, so they go too slow. So if you try to drive up a hill in the snow and you're going too slow, you start sliding and stop, you know, you get stuck because you, you don't have enough momentum to make it, you know, your wheels are not going to grip up the hill. So basically there was people in front of us going too slow, so then he and I both ended up getting kind of stuck a little bit. So basically, to make a long story short, I was feeling really scared because I feel like I'm a pretty good driver, but I didn't want to slide into another car and I didn't want another car to slide into me. So basically, I backed down the hill with his help. My boyfriend sort of guided me. I backed down the hill and I turned onto a side road that was flat and I parked. It was a legal, safe, flat place to park. I just parked my car. It was at this point, it was like four o'clock in the morning or three something. I don't know. It was really late. And it was amazing because it was New Year's Eve. There was tons of people driving around at like three thirty in the morning, more than you would think. So it was hard for us to like figure out when to like, you know, have the space for me to find a safe parking spot. So finally, I found a safe parking spot in between all the other cars. I parked and I grabbed my stuff and locked my car safely and hopped into my boyfriend's car. And then we had to wait until other people got out of our way and because other people kept getting stuck. And so we had to help a couple people. He helped somebody back down the hill and they planned a different strategy on how they were going to get home. We decided we were going to go up the hill. And to make a long story short, we made it. Because what my boyfriend did was he went all the way down to the bottom of the hill. And then he got enough speed. I think he needed to go about 30 miles an hour to get up the hill. Because a lot of people were trying to go up the hill at 10 or 20 miles an hour, which doesn't work. So he went about 30 or 35 going up this hill. And we made it. It was difficult, but we made it. We kind of slid a little bit and... The traction wasn't as good as normal, but we made it all the way up the hill and we made it to his house and we got there like at four o'clock in the morning or three thirty or I don't know when, but we made it to his house and I was still shaking, still felt sick. And I was just feeling a little paranoid. Like I was thinking that the whole city was snowed in. And then I found out later that in my neighborhood in the central district in Capitol Hill in Les Shy, it was hardly any snow at all. So for whatever reason, Rainier Beach and Burien and I guess SeaTac Airport got a lot of snow because I guess it's a higher elevation. So it's amazing that you can get like three to five inches of snow in one neighborhood and then you hardly get any in some other neighborhood that's on a different elevation or closer to the water. So basically we had an epic snowstorm experience and I ended up uh, walking around by myself out in the snow and making videos and photos of the snow and spinning around in circles and showing everybody the snow and but I was really tired and stressed out at that point so I had a really long day because I delivered groceries for several hours and then I went to my boyfriend's show and danced and then I went on the epic snow drive <laughs> And then stayed at my boyfriend's and then the next day I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to get home. But to make a long story short, the snow started melting. It was like 37 degrees and I was able to get my car home safely. The roads were fine. And now in Seattle, we're having a, a cold snap. So now it's like below freezing, but the sky is clear and there's no snow coming down. So we basically have dry weather. Oh, yeah, it's actually quite sunny right now and I might actually take a walk. So, wow, I've done a 44-minute monologue off the top of my head. That's pretty amazing that I could talk this long. But basically, I had my, my 2017 started off with a snowstorm and an epic drive in the snow and a stay up all night long with your boyfriend. Well, we stayed up till about 6 in the morning or 5.30 in the morning. And I was feeling kind of scared and stressed out. And he was being really sweet and kind to me and helping me. Uh, through that I'm really grateful so it's amazing um, I live by myself my boyfriend and I don't live together 
And I feel like that's just better for me right now. Maybe someday I'll live with him. I don't know. But I really kind of like having my own space. And I, I feel so, so grateful that I can afford. I got my Section 8 voucher because I'm low income. And I work really hard, but I don't know how to make more than like, you know, 1500 bucks a month or whatever. So basically, I've got my Section 8 voucher and I have a nice landlord and I have my own washer and dryer and a parking space. And I'm so blessed and so amazed and so lucky, although I have worked hard. I worked hard finding this apartment and finding this nice landlord and I filled out lots of paperwork and had to jump through all the hoops to prove my income status to the Section 8 people. And my income taxes are pretty complicated and difficult because I'm, you know, freelance and work at like 15 or 20 different places and um, have all kinds of 1099s and W-4s. And so that's some of my challenges in life. And I'm in therapy and I'm I'm taking diatomaceous earth and feeding it to my cat, like I said earlier. And so I'm basically using myself as a science lab. I do a little bit of both. I do research online. I listen to what people say. I trust people that are more naturopathic based than allopathic based. I feel like the immune system and nutrition, nutrition and your immune system, I think are the two keys to health for dog, for dogs, cats, humans, for most species, probably. So basically, if you eat a diet that's as healthy as possible for your body and you exercise and you drink water and you sleep enough and you have positive loving relationships with people, plants, you know, etc., animals, people, plants, if you do all of that, then your immune system is probably as good as it can be. And then if there's supplements you could take to help your immune system even more, find out about those. And I was going to say, and if you still need medication and or surgery after you do that, then I figure, okay, do medication, do surgery. But I feel like people should also make sure to eat healthy food. I guess some people just don't want to eat healthy food. They'd rather take a pill or inject themselves with, with drugs or medications I am not somebody who likes that. My whole life has been, you know, my parents are both like that too. They're kind of more natural type people. So I was kind of raised with that kind of question everything idea, you know, be skeptical of don't just, just because somebody is a doctor doesn't mean that they're, that that they're telling you the right thing. I mean, you can go to four different doctors and all four of them might say something a little different. I have a tendency to trust naturopaths more than mainstream allopathic doctors because of the emphasis on nutrition and the biochemistry of everything you eat and drink affects your brain chemistry and your body chemistry and your digestive system. So to me, the most powerful, powerful thing you can do for your health, mental or physical, is to eat as healthy as you can, which is like to not eat a lot of sugar or processed foods or starches and to eat mostly organic fresh foods, which is like fruits, vegetables, meats, beans, seeds, nuts. I don't eat a lot of grains at all, but I eat beans, seeds, nuts, meat, fruits, vegetables. I try to avoid processed foods. I love ice cream. I drink some coffee every day. Mostly I drink green tea. Mostly I actually just drink water. I don't drink a lot of juice. I drink a little kombucha sometimes, which is fermented good bacteria drink. I think it's made from uh, fermented mushrooms. Um, I take ashwagandha. I take spirulina. I'm a nude model. I'm a natural person. Um, I don't know. I feel like my naturism and my nudism... And my health and nutrition is all connected. And my spiritual, I'm kind of a spiritual person who loves nature. I meditate. I think of God as, um, I don't think of God as a man in the sky. I don't really believe in God like a man in the sky or a woman who judges us. I believe God is like energy that creates the universe. And I believe that, I don't really believe, I just feel it in my heart and soul and my gut. I kind of feel that God is great spirit. You know, it's like energy consciousness that creates the universe. Uh, I was exposed as a kid to Krishnamurti and Zen Buddhism and the philosophy of um, saints and sages and Eastern philosophy. And both my parents sort of encouraged me to think for myself and question everything 
they didn't tell me that I had to be religious or not religious. My dad is kind of agnostic, leaning in a more atheistic direction. My mom is more into mystical Advaita Vedanta non-duality. I was raised with these kinds of ideas, but I was raised to decide for myself. My parents didn't tell me I had to agree with them. They said, this is what we believe or we feel, and you can just, you know, you can figure out what you want. And so I didn't go to church as a kid at all from either side of my family, my mom's side or my dad's side. <clears throat> so I was kind of raised in a non-traditional open-minded way and a more scientific way. Um, I like science of mind, which is a philosophy that combines uh, spirituality and wisdom with, with um, science and nature. And it's kind of like some people think you either have to be a scientific atheist or you have to be a religious person that doesn't believe in science. And to me, both of those extremes are not very, not very full of wisdom. I feel like, to me, the wisest people are the ones that see that science and spirituality are, they line up and they, and they overlap. And I guess the, to me, the truth about reality and, and life and nature on this earth is where science and spiritual wisdom overlap. And anything that uh, doesn't overlap, like scientists can't really prove that there's no God, but they can't really prove that there is a God. So to me, to me, that just means that, you know, science, okay, it's hard to explain, but there's a lot of religious ideas that I think are ridiculous and like superstitious. And I feel like the Bible is full of metaphor and it's taken too literally. And I feel like, you know, when they say that, that um, uh, animals have no soul, you know, it's kind of like a speciesist type attitude, like humans are superior to all other species. I don't really believe that. I believe that humans are very complicated and we are very interesting, creative species on this planet but we are also the only species that is destroying the planet like we've done amazing things invented solar panels and invented penicillin and all kinds of amazing things that help life but we've also done horrible things to destroy the planet so I certainly don't think that humans are superior to all other species and if anything I feel like because we are so powerful it's all the more reason why we should take care of the plants and animals and we should take care of the earth and we should be stewards of the earth. So I guess I'm more in alignment with Native American wisdom, great spirit, you know, Mother Earth, Father Sky, you know, the sun and the moon and all the planets. I mean, it's kind of like we are the caretaker of this planet Earth and we are part of nature. And I feel like humans are not separate from nature. I feel like I'm part of nature. I'm part of plants and animals. And I don't think I'm superior to plants and animals and I tend to to not kill like if I see a spider I don't kill the spider I let the spider be and if it's a poisonous spider I guess I'll just put it outside but if it's just a spider I just let it be and um, one time I had a mouse in my apartment and I didn't know it and my cat caught it and ate it and I was sad for the mouse but I was happy that the, the my cat was happy that he caught a mouse and he ate it and that was fine but I feel really sad when people set mouse traps and when people kill, when people use pesticides and they kill plants and animals. It just really upsets me. So I do kill fleas and ticks and bed bugs and mosquitoes, but I don't kill bees or wasps or spiders. And if I have a mouse in my apartment, hopefully I don't have one now, but hopefully my cat would just, you know, get it but I would prefer to not harm it actually. So I guess if I saw a mouse, if my cat didn't get it, maybe I would just put it outside. Although it probably wouldn't survive because it's probably too cold outside for a mouse, but I don't know. But I just feel, um, I'm just telling you some of my philosophy about life. I feel like God is energy that creates the universe. And I kind of resonate with Native American ideas, but I'm just not religious. I could never follow any particular religion. I've done a 10 day Vipassana silent meditation retreat, which is kind of a, a Buddhist type. It's not really religious though, but it's kind of about just paying attention to your body and being in the present moment. I love Eckhart Tolle and Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dyer. May he rest in peace, Wayne Dyer. And I just love being open-minded and discovering new things and questioning and thinking for myself. Again, I'll let you know how it goes with the diatomaceous earth. 
feeding my cat diatomaceous earth very, very gradually and slowly and cautiously. I'm also feeding myself diatomaceous earth every day and seeing how that goes and eating a healthy diet of mostly fruits, vegetables, beans, seeds, and nuts. Don't eat a lot of processed food. Don't eat a lot of sugar, although I do have a weakness for ice cream. So my cat, again, is on a raw meat, frozen and freeze-dried diet that I get at the health food pet store, balanced for cats specifically. I might get a recipe and learn how to make my own raw cat meat food, but I don't really want to buy liver and heart and grind it up. I don't have a food processor. I guess I would need a food processor to grind up organ meats because they say that if you just feed a cat or a dog just chicken or beef, that's not really nutritionally balanced for them. It's better if you also feed them liver and heart and you know organ meats mixed in with the regular meat. So I'm not sure if I want to go to the complicatedness of doing that. And then I would freeze it in the freezer for at least three days to make sure to kill any bad bacteria that could be in the meat. Make sure it's safe for the pet to eat. But then you've got to add vitamins and minerals. So I'm just feeding my cat the kind that the health food store makes that's uh, balanced for cats. And also the key too is variety. Some people think they should just feed their pet the same thing over and over and over. But imagine what it's like for humans. I mean, cats and dogs are not that different from us. Would you just want to eat salmon every day and nothing else? I mean, it's better if you eat beef, chicken, turkey, lamb, rabbit, venison, you know, every kind of meat that you can think of that's, that's healthy and good to eat and vary it. You know, give your pet, give your cat or dog a variety of food that's, that's you know, natural and raw and pesticide and antibiotic free has vitamins and minerals and fiber. But I mean, also just for the cat's or dog's enjoyment. I mean, I feed my cat, I'm trying to vary it a little bit here and there so that he can be stimulated and enjoy different flavors and get different nutritional balances in these different kinds of foods. You know, I'm sure that lamb and chicken and turkey and venison and beef are all a little bit different in terms of the minerals and vitamins and the the, you know, even the color and the texture and the smell of these foods is all different. And so I'm sure that he's having a lot more fun because he gets a variety of food. So just like humans, cats and dogs and humans, we like variety and we like diversity. And I feel like the way to be healthy as a cat or a dog or a human is to have a variety of foods in your diet, plus different animals, Different humans and dogs and cats probably respond differently to different kinds of meats and fruits and vegetables. We all have different bodies. So it's good to experiment and have diversity in your diet so that you can also enjoy yourself and enjoy the different flavors and textures, but also so that your body can soak up different minerals and vitamins and minerals and just different, uh, all the different nutrients, the live raw enzymes that are in these different meats that I feed my cat. I'm sure that are different for him in different ways. And so I feel like for my cat to be the healthiest cat he can be, I need to feed him the most variety in his diet as I possibly can. So I'm really happy and grateful that they make raw, frozen and freeze dried food for cats and dogs that is safe to eat. And I'm just so grateful. So thank you so much for joining me. My name is Shannon Kringen. This is Goddess Kring. If you go to my website, shannonkringen.com, you can see my visual art. I have blogs and photos and videos and MP3 music tracks. And I'm on Mixcloud and Instagram and Flickr and YouTube and just many different sites. Just Google Shannon Kringen or Goddess Kring, S-H-A-N-N-O-N-K-R-I-N-G-E-N. Goddess Kring, of course, G-O-D-D-E-S-S-K-R-I-N-G. Goddess Kring, because my last name is Kringen. That's why I gave myself that nickname. I live in Seattle. I'm 48 years old. I am a figure model and multimedia artist. I love to travel and I thank you so much. Wow. I think this is the first time I've done my entire 60 minute show in one sitting. Now I just have to tweak this and edit it and polish it up. And thank you for joining me and and follow your bliss, follow your dreams. I'm open to any questions or comments you might have. I love questions and comments. I can talk about what it's like to be a model, talk about my artwork, um, the artist I love named Hunderwasser, some of the traveling I've done. I'm really interested, as you can tell, in nutrition because I rambled on about nutrition 
And I'll see you next week. I'm on, uh, I do a new podcast every single week. I put it on Mixcloud and YouTube and all over the place. Thank you for listening and on Bandcamp as well. I have a Patreon as well. Bye bye. Crumple still skin. Crumple still skin. Amazed at the orange mount. Crumple still skin. Stripe there, Stripe volt there. this, Stripe volt this. volty rinsing it off, undulate. Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Goddess Kring, Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Goddess Kring, Goddess Kring.